How's everyone doing tonight? Well, will you please rise as we honor our Lord and Savior and bless his name with something called blessed be his name, your name. One, two, three, and. Put your hands together for me. Celebration night. Streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out. I turn back to pain when the darkness shows is in your still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, for the pain and the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I turn back to pain. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will do the same. Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be your glory. Let's sing it again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Give him out a shout of praise tonight. One. Two, three, and strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our Lord, our strong defender. You are the Oh, 
Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God.
you as king and you ask him and i will serve you i will serve give you, you everything Trust you. I will trust you. Trust you alone. Trust in you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of the praise. I will give you all my worship. together this is a clap one hey oh hey oh ah. you got a vision you got a dream but it feels like a miles away you got your passion you got to believe and this is why you were made it takes a little time takes a little time it takes a little time to see i said it takes a little time takes a little time it takes a little time to believe we can rise above the typical and everything the usual we know we know we know that there's no such thing as impossible and nothing is unreachable when we trust the God of miracles We know, we know, we know, we know That there's no such thing as impossible Hey! Oh! Oh! We never give in the spirit of fear Only the power of love we keep on running and now go we His strength is more than enough I said it takes a little time, takes a little time It takes a little time to see I said it takes a little time, takes a little time Takes a little time to believe We can rise above the typical And be anything unusual We know, we know, we know that there's no such thing Impossible. Nothing is impossible when we trust in God and miracles. We know, we know, we know that there's no such thing as impossible. Oh, there is no such, no such thing. There is no such, no such thing. Come on now. There is no such, no such thing. It's impossible, impossible. There is no such, no such thing. No, there is no such, no such thing. There is no such, no such thing. That's impossible, impossible. We can rise above the typical and be anything unusual. We know, we know, we know. There's no such thing as impossible And nothing is unreachable When we trust the God of miracle We know, we know, we know That there's no such thing as impossible Whoa
That's right. Nothing's impossible with our Lord and Savior right here within our hearts. Three, four. Because you and I can trust the God of miracles. Amen. Well, listen, love you guys. So grateful that you came tonight because I know you picked a great weekend to be here. And uh, the one thing that I know more than anything else is that we all need is an encounter with God. Amen. And that encounter is a breakthrough that God is desperate to provide in your life and in my life. Well, listen, do me a favor. We're going to share that love. Turn around, greet someone, say hello, make a friend, invite somebody out for coffee or bagel or something.
you guys are a friendly, friendly group of people. That's awesome. There must be somebody here that's bringing all the smiles out of us. That's just fantastic. Well, let me just welcome everyone, and uh, especially our first-time guests and returning guests who are here with us today. And I want all our first-time guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just quickly pulling out this weekend program, if, if you don't have one, just raise your hand. One of our rushes would love to get you one. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here at New Hope. I'm not going to be able to go over everything. All I can tell you is that, that we can't get everything into this weekend program. And uh, that's because of you guys are just... You guys are just awesome, loving people, the hurting, the broken, the disenfranchised, uh, because we know that that pleases our Father's heart. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things that if you're saying, hey, listen, how do I get to connected here at New Hope? How do I kind of plug in? How can I use my gifts and talents? Uh, the first thing I'm going to encourage you to do is take a moment, pull out this pink connection card. It says connection card right there. And... Uh, whether you're a first-time guest, returning guest, or one of our regulars, if you have not gotten an email from me this week, okay, uh, you're not on our list. And so either we just had a real hard time reading your Greek and Aramaic when you wrote it down, um, or because of you know, my, my Brooklyn education, I, I can't tell the difference between a P and a T, uh, Anyway, do me a favor. There's pens right in front of you in those little pockets. Take a moment and just whatever you feel comfortable, name, email. Uh, this is a, really the first step uh, and really being able to kind of say, okay, how do I get uh, to use my gifts and talents here? And uh, we believe uh, in, the belie uh, the, in the priesthood of believers. And so we know that we can't accomplish God's mission without you. And so you're that valuable to God and you're that valuable to us for the glory of God. And so just take a moment, fill that out. Uh, there's opportunities to sign up uh, for a whole bunch of things there. And, uh, but most importantly, on the back of this connection card is what I'm going to say is our prayer request. And uh, we want to come alongside you and pray with you in the circumstances of your life. And so uh, we just want you to know that you're not alone. You're not doing this life, this, this journey with God alone. Uh, you have other brothers and sisters here uh, who want to be able to be an encouragement to you and to be able to just love on you. If you allow us, we're not going to push ourselves on you naturally. Uh, but when you finish filling that out, uh, anytime, any one of those offering boxes you see around uh, the worship center here, just feel free to drop that in. Because every Monday night, uh, our leaders, uh, pastors, we pray over every single one of these requests. And then when we're finished praying for it, we hand it off to our Prayer warriors and intercessors, and they pray. And I'm telling you, uh, we have seen God answer prayer. We have seen God provide jobs and uh, miraculously heal sickness and disease because He is real, He is alive, and He answers prayer. Amen? All right, where are my little ones? Do we have any little ones tonight? Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. One knee at a time. Nothing. Yeah, I know. My little preacher boy. <laughs> hey. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> well, listen. We love children here at New Hope, and we want to be able to create wonderful spaces and environments that these children will be able to experience the love of God and learn the truths of God. And I just want to, if you have not had an opportunity to go over to the children's side and to see all the wonderful things that they have done in those classrooms and in the hallways, and I mean, just amazing places for these children. And so uh, either uh, after service, you want to go over there, that'd be great, just a wonderful opportunity. And I just want you to see that uh, I'm telling you, um, Amy and her team go through wonderful, all right, they're all over the place. So how about we just pray for our little ones before they 
Run off the stage, right? Yeah. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for these children. I want to thank you, Lord, for the parents that brought them. I pray, Father God, uh, Lord, for all our servant uh, leader volunteers that prepared lessons all week long, not only in our children, but in our youth and our middle school and high schoolers. Uh, Father, to invest, Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ. May those seeds go deep in their lives. May they learn to trust Jesus and realize that he can do the impossible. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. There you go, buddy. Oh. <laughs> Bye-bye, sweetie. <laughs> awesome. Boy, I tell you, the energy level is absolutely amazing, isn't that? Well, let me, uh, let me ask you, if you have your Bibles, take a moment, take them out, take your electronic device. If you have a phone, a tablet, whatever it is that you use to have uh, God's Word. And um, what I want, I want us to do is I just want to take us a moment and kind of still our hearts and just allow the word. I got two pairs of scriptures. I just want to, I'm just going to read them. And I, I just want God's word just to kind of envelop us in this room and allow it to speak to us, to our hearts, uh, as the Holy Spirit would lead us. Amen? So uh, do me a favor and uh, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 58, and we'll be, I'm going to be reading verse 18 and 19. It says... I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on his lips of the mourner in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. Five promises of God just right here in this passage. That if you're hurting, God's going to heal you. That if you're confused, God's going to guide you. That if you feel alone, God's going to comfort you. And if you feel helpless, God's going to restore you. And if you feel anxious, God says peace to you. Let me give you one more passage here. In um, Romans chapter 12, um, I'm just going to start from verse 1. I just... Therefore, brothers, I urge you, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to have an opportunity now to hear Another Recovery Road Testimony. The first 10 years of my life in suburban Chicago were pretty normal. My family attended church every week as my dad was the head usher and my mom sang in the choir. I loved God and Sunday school, but more than anything, I adored my father. My world was rocked when my father was killed instantly in a car accident on his way home from work when I was 10 years old. Life as I knew it would never be the same. When the shock and denial wore off, I was angry at God. Well-meaning members of the church and family reassured me that God had taken my father and he was in a better place. How dare God? I needed my father much more than he did. I raised my fist to heaven and swore that I would show God. Thus began decades of rebellion aimed at my creator. By the time I was 12, I was brought home by the police for underage drinking. It was the mid-60s and sex, drugs, and rock and roll was the theme. 
My mom moved us to Wisconsin the year after my dad died. This move only created more anger in me, and as a seventh grader, I got in with the delinquent crowd. I used every drug I could get my hands on, beginning with inhalants, alcohol and pot, progressing to prescription drugs, LSD, speed, and narcotics. I loved the feeling of escaping my emotional pain. By the time I was 16, I was a blackout drinker. I hitchhiked all over the country. I placed my life in danger on many occasions and was in trouble with the law for stealing, drinking, running away from home, and even a felony charge as a minor for calling it a bomb scare to my high school. I was fearless because I didn't care about me or anyone else. I got pregnant at 16 and had to go to New York because that's the only place abortion was legal in 1971. By a miracle, I graduated from high school and continued my insane living as an adult, ending up in Colorado in my early 20s. I sure was showing God, wasn't I? At 22, while high on drugs and alcohol, my boyfriend and I were in a serious car accident. He drove the car off the side of the mountain and the car flipped end over end all the way down. He died instantly and I was airlifted to the hospital. When I came to an ICO, the Lord was standing at the foot of my bed and said, I have saved your life and you will serve me. I was okay with that, but who is God and how do I find him? It certainly was not the God of my childhood that had taken my father. I went to gurus, Buddhist temples and the like looking for him. Then God miraculously brought my friend that I had started using drugs with at age 12 back into my life. She was a born again Christian and took me to her church where I flew to the altar when the call was given. I cried for what seemed like years, repenting of my rebellion. I had a hunger for knowledge and for an understanding of this merciful God. I wish that I could say that I remained drug and alcohol free and have walked with God ever since. I have had many relapses and wanderings from God, interspersed with recovery and actively serving Him. In 1985, I entered my first alcohol rehab. I stayed clean and sober for 12 years, even though I never dealt with my emotional pain. I even worked in drug and alcohol rehab where I met and married my third husband. I desperately wanted children, and God blessed me with three amazing sons in my mid-30s. I didn't think I could have children after numerous abortions, miscarriages, and infections. I stayed sober the majority of their growing years as they became my obsession, along with serving God and community in various capacities. As my sons grew and my marriage became very toxic, I grew disillusioned with the church, and once again, turned to my escape of emotional pain through chemicals. My life spiraled out of control as I tried to wear masks to hide my pain and addiction. I went to numerous treatment facilities and participated in several addiction programs, trying to clean up my act so I appeared together for others to see. I struggled with people pleasing and thought if I could convince others I was okay, then I would be. I struggled with combining my Christian walk with my recovery journey. Many Christians, including pastors, would tell me that I didn't need a recovery program, that God could take away my addictions. My relapses became more frequent. In 2008, I went to a three-month Christian inpatient program in Atlanta, and there I was introduced to celebrate recovery, and I was able to begin facing my emotional pain. When I returned to Northport, I found a CR program in Port Charlotte and have been attending ever since. I had my final relapse 21 months ago when, once again, my whole world was rocked. I had a DUI accident and lost my driver's license, my 28-year marriage, and finally, my pride and rebellion. I returned to my first love, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I dug in deep and have really made a searching and fearless moral inventory and have truly turned my will and I life over to God's care. I am learning to love myself and my story and allow God to use me. I love Psalms 34, 5. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. I am living for an audience of one, and I have never felt more joy, peace, and hope. I am working together with God on my flaws. His grace is sufficient for me, for his power is made perfect in my weakness. I am providing the honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, and he is sanctifying me one day at a time. My prayer is Psalm 19:14. May the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And this is my recovery story. Abba Father, we, um, we are blown away by, Father, your ceaseless pursuit of us, Lord, that continues, Lord, to reach out to us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our pain. Father, I thank you that before the foundations of the earth, Lord, you had already planned our recovery back to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we, as we have sang today, Lord, there is nothing that is impossible when we put our trust in you, the God of miracles. I pray, Father, that every single one of us here today, Lord, would experience Father, your miraculous power. I pray, Lord, that there would be a breakthrough, Father, right now, because you are the one that's able. Not that we're able, but that you're able. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, I've learned um, certain things over the years. And... This probably has been something that has been wrestling with for a long, long time. And I've come to the conclusion that without God, we all have hurts that we will never forget. Without God, we all have habits that we can never get rid of. Without God, we have hang-ups that will constantly mess up our lives. And let me just tell you that time does not heal all wounds. In truth, time probably makes it worse when you and I just stuff it, bury it, and cast it aside or run away from it. So I want you to consider that only Jesus can empower you and me to be able to deal with life's issues and allow us to change from sadness to hope, from despair to greater joy in Him. And for this reason is why we're continuing our study called Recovery Road, because there are just way too many of us who are just stuck in this life. So as we examine today's scriptures, let's explore the life-changing power of admitting our need for God to remove our character flaws. I want you to hear that. Because this is critical. You and I, the life-transforming power, begins when you and I begin to admit our need for God to remove our character flaws. And I believe this is best understood when you and I consider how Jesus did not die just to get people into heaven. Jesus died to get heaven into people. Right here and right now. Now, I believe this teaches you and me that until God is all that you and I have, you and I will never recognize that God is everything we'll ever need. And that's why 
You and I need to cooperate with God and focus our minds on the benefits, the privilege, and the power of Jesus. So as we examine and we come to today's scripture passage, we're going to unpack three biblical principles to cooperate with God to renew our minds so that He would be able to remove the character flaws in us that are hindering you and me from this abundant life that God has promised. And so the first biblical principle is to focus our minds on doing good, not feeling good. Second biblical principle to focus our minds on good things, not bad things. And the third biblical principle is to focus our minds on God's power, not our willpower. Amen? All right. So, if you wouldn't mind taking out uh, your Bibles, and uh, we're going to go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, and um, verse 8. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, we've pretty much parked every week, and we're going to continue to park here because this word blessed. And I want you to understand that blessed in the original language means total flourishing. So what is it? that God wants you and me to totally flourish in. And so every week we've been pulling out one characteristic after another. And if you haven't been here uh, the last few weeks, uh, we have most of the messages online, and we're working on getting the other ones online. Um, But uh, they will eventually be online. I can't encourage you enough um, to go back if you've missed one, and really because each one is really unpacking a lot of what God, I believe, wants to do in our lives. And um, bless it. Total flourishing. Well, total flourishing, I believe, is that when you and I begin to focus our minds on doing good and not feeling good. We've, we've got into a culture where feeling good has become the thing that we park on, it's, it's what we build our lives on, it becomes a foundation. The problem is that feelings aren't truth. Feelings aren't truth. Feelings are like an engine light on a car. Now I've had an engine light on my car, I had to buy a little figurine and put it there in the dashboard to hide it because it just drives me nuts. The car works fine, it's driving fine, it's just fantastic, all right? The problem is some sensor with the gas cap, if it gets air in it, it just triggers it off. It's so annoying. So I just kind of hide it, all right? But, but feelings are like that. Feelings, feelings are not truth. Feelings can say that maybe there's something wrong. It's kind of like if I walk, if you come into a room and I'm standing behind the door and I jump out at you and all immediately you get afraid, but the reality is nothing to fear from me because I'm not there to harm you. I'm just being silly. But your emotions at that time, your feelings at the time, are fear. And so naturally you've got to think about it and go, okay, there's Eddie being silly. I don't have to be afraid. He's just being silly. What I want, what I believe is ultimately that you and I would park on truth. And doing good is ultimately what God wants us to do. And I believe that doing good and not... Focusing on doing good, not feeling good, is how you and I are going to overcome our sense of powerlessness. There are way too many of us who feel powerless in our situation, powerless in our circumstance. Things are just totally out of control. I have no power, no way of handling it. You know, and then we, we fall into the trap of the enemy. It's always going to be like this. That is a lie that comes out of the pit of hell. Because your God is greater than your circumstance. And your 
almost right when you say you're powerless because in yourself you have no power, but you have a daddy in heaven who has all the power to release it on your behalf and my behalf. Can we trust in the God of miracles? But see, this is what I've discovered in Eddie's life. In my own life, I have this thing called my human nature. Anybody have one of those? <laughs> see, in our human nature, I have this biological issue. It's called germs, genes, chromosomes, whatever. <laughs> however you want to put it in there. But my natural gene pool has a tendency towards certain problems. My gene pool has a certain pattern to lean into certain areas of problems that for some strange reason I park at all the time. But let me just tell you something. Even though my biology might have a tendency to constantly think of me, myself, and I over you, if my, bio my biology and my gene pool has a tendency to constantly be self-absorbed and self-centered, I want you to hear, because you're not powerless, that it's no excuse for sin. Because God has the power. So my biology gets in the way because of my human nature. I also have another problem because of my human nature. Sociology. Circumstances, the environment that you and I grew up in. I was raised a certain way in Brooklyn. We have a funny way of talking and we have a funny way of speaking with people and we have a funny way of feeling better than most. Nine out of ten times is just our response of covering up either unmet needs or hurts. But what I feel, lots of times, we just settle for the scraps that this life has to offer when God is offering you and me the kingdom and this massive banquet. And he's prepared it since the foundations of the earth because he wants you as his honored guest to attend and we run, and we push back, and we fall into our human nature, and we allow our ego and our pride and our self-centeredness rule the day. But again, our sociology is not an excuse for sin, because our God is able that in the midst of whatever circumstance you and I find ourselves, whatever culture we came out of, whatever family paradigm that you and I were born from, that is not our identity. The world does not give you and me our identity. Our Heavenly Father has spoken that already into your life and my life. And we have greater ability. Also, because of my human nature, I got this thing, theological. What do you mean, the what do you mean theological? What does that mean? Do you know that your values and your core convictions drive your choices? Yeah. And if we have wrong theology... We have wrong convictions and wrong values that we've gotten basically because our biology leans towards it or we were raised out of a certain family paradigm or culture or... And we've built a sense of values and convictions that we've basically lived by, but they're contrary to the Word of God. And then we wonder why we continually end up in a cycle of failure over and over. And we're constantly repeating the same issues of the past. 
God has a perfect way to deal with our human nature. He's crucified it on the cross. <laughs> you and I, in Christ, are no longer a slave to this thing. When you and I theologically make a choice to follow Jesus and put our trust in the miracle maker, he now dwells in us and gives us the ability to subject this flesh to his word. And that too, for some insane reason, out of his love and mercy, he allows us to choose that. That doesn't mean we choose everything in the world, but he does give us a small scope of choice. And he wants us to totally flourish in that area. Blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart. See, I love this thing in pure in heart because it really, I, I believe it identifies something very simple. When we understand our human nature and we understand that you and I have choice. You and I can have the choice to focus on good things or focus on bad things. Yeah. I probably have this conversation with my dad more times than I got fingers and toes. See, my dad has nothing but disdain for the church. I've probably said this a hundred times, you know. But when I was young, and my dad always said, listen, son, stay away from pastors. All they want is your money or your wife. They're bad people. <laughs> now, the thing is, I had that voice in the back of my head for a long, long time. And this is what I told my dad. I said, dad, you know what? Let, let's just take faith out. Let's just take religion out. Let's just use this thing called the brain God gave us, right? And I said, okay, Dad, this is, this is what I think we can agree on. If you and I, if you always focus on the negative, what are you going to see? We all know that, don't we? So why do we park there? Why do we park there in our relationships? Why do we park there in our finances? Why do we park there when we look at our brother and sister? Why do we always see the flaws, which is a choice, instead of allowing the Spirit of God to be able to see a broken person and see the beauty of the image of God in them instead of all the flaws? Isn't that amazing? See, when we begin to focus on good things and not the bad things, that's the way you and I are going to be able to overcome and break this cycle of failure over and over and over and over in our life. And we have this thing, what I'm going to call is the human condition. We have a human nature and we have a human condition. You know what the human condition is? This is probably the number one thing, regardless of what culture, man, woman, and child, I am absolutely convinced that you and me are not God. I just, just a clue, just a clue, okay? You and I are not, that's our condition. We are not God. Okay, you got to hear that. Let's say it all together, ready? ready? We are not God. That's our human condition. And in the midst of that human condition, the problem is, is that when we come to grips with that, when we admit that to ourselves, that's when deep change is going to begin to come. Because since you and me are not God, I think, and I could probably speak for everyone in the room, there are times when your life and my life become just downright unmanageable, doesn't it? And somehow, I, I, I'm guilty, I am guilty, okay? Somehow I feel I can control it. 
I can control the relationship. I can control my finances. I can control the way people look at me. If I wear enough mask, if I, if I put enough front going on, I mean, somehow I can control it. And that's because somehow in the back of your brain and my brain, we think we're God. But if deep change is going to happen, you and I got to come to that place that we're not God. And we need to admit to ourselves our need for him in every area of our life. But see, the problem is, this is, this is the problem of our human condition. Longevity. You know, I've been doing the same thing since I was a wee lad. And I really don't know any other way to do it. Matter of fact, I've been doing it so long, I can't even imagine not doing it that way anymore. I can't imagine. I start telling myself, well, that's just the way I am. Hmm. You are almighty God, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, where your nature never changes, right? Think about what, you're, think about what we're saying. Longevity. Many of our habits and patterns are developed in childhood. And this is what I've experienced over the last 52 years of my life. I see 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds acting like middle schoolers. Really? Really? Come on! Who in the world wants? I dream about going back to middle school, don't you? No, no nobody does. It just it, it blows my mind. The way we respond to our family, our spouses, our children, our neighbor, our co-worker, our friend. The way we carry these patterns over and over simply because we've never dealt with them. We've never admitted our need for God to remove these character flaws that we've been carrying around since middle school and now we're 50, 60, 70 and we're still carrying them. Not only longevity, I think sometimes this human condition is, um, this is probably a bizarre one, it's the payoff. You know what the payoff is? You and I have this tendency to mask our pain because there's a payoff that somehow I'm protecting myself. Somehow, people will really see some, what I want them to see, a projection of myself, that I'm better or I'm someone who's worth attention, worth love, worth acceptance. When your father has already loved you and accepted you and believes you are fearfully and wonderfully made and he rejoices over you with singing and he's counted every hair on your head and he's made you the apple of his eye and, and somehow we think that wearing the mask is a better payoff than what God has already said to you and to me <laughs> and so we think that we can't change and when we begin to do that is that we basically have what I would say is a self-fulfilled prophecy and you and I need God in a way who's going to break that. Pure in heart. Focus on the good things. You know, one of the other things I like to mention, I know, I know that I'm going to get a little pushback. You and I have an enemy. Satan, the devil... And the reality is that he is constantly, aggressively trying to remind you of all your flaws and all your imperfections. 
He's trying to constantly bring up all the negative thoughts that you've ever had or someone's ever had of you and then play it like a recorder in your mind. You're no good, you're a bum, you'll never amount to anything. And we've probably heard that and we have it in our mind over and over and over and over and the enemy just can't wait. When God has already paid that on the cross, the blood that he shed for you. He's already given his body. He's already paid the debt on that. And your enemy is going to continue to bring it up. You know, constantly plant those thoughts in your mind and somehow we believe it to be true. And it is a lie. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I want to encourage you is that you and I need to see God's power and not rely on our willpower. Somehow, we have bought into the lie that if I just try hard enough, if, if, if I do enough good things, if, if, if I'm able to, you know, run harder, walk harder, if I'm able to, to, to pray harder, read the Bible more, do all these things, somehow I'm, this is going to measure up and God's going to love me more. God's going to save me more. Listen, this is what the book tells me. God is, can't love you any more than he already loves you. That's like my son coming to me and telling me, Dad, I, you know, I, I clean up my room because I want you to love me more. And you're sitting there going, really? I'd be broken. So you think that if you did these five things, I would then love you more than what I already love you? My response, but then you don't know me at all. That's what break, that one would break my heart. It's what breaks our Father's heart. Every time you and I think that if I do these 15 things, these rituals, these ceremonies, these traditions, I, I jump through all these hoops, and then maybe, maybe God will accept me more and love me more and... and, and, and And we die a thousand deaths of dead religion. You need to focus on God's power, God's saving grace. You, got, you and I got to focus on the finished work of Jesus. That is where you and I, because not only do we have this human nature, not only do we have this human condition, I want you to understand that you and I have this thing called human limitation. It's the reason why we need a Savior every single day. Because left to my own devices, I will never be able to see God. Matter of fact, it's not even in my nature to pursue God. My nature has one pursuit, me, myself, and I. My nature has one purpose, self-absorption. And that's why the scripture says that even though you and I were at enmity with God, he died for us anyway. How much more can he love you than that? How much more can that be? The Bible says that the greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Well, Jesus took that to a whole nother level. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his enemy. The one who spit at him, the one who mocked him, the one who violated him and crucified him and tore him down. How much more can you add? How much more love could that be? What could you and I add? Anything to that? We need to see God. Focus on God's power, not our willpower, because that is the only way that we're going to overcome 
our uncontrollable lives. We need to admit that we are powerless to change our past. Too many of us are parking in the past. We still remember the pain. But see, all the resentment and all the shame, that, my friends, God wants to set you and me free from. Many of us are living our lives and making choices, and we, our worldview is so full of guilt and shame and regret and resentment and bitterness. And then we're wondering why we can't love. We can't show compassion or mercy. A human limitation has to also admit that we are powerless to control other people. God's given you and me power over one human being in the whole planet. Ourselves. That's it. There are times when I said, you know, I got... I remember my boys were, were still teenagers. I mean, now they're all grown men, but... Man, I tell you, know, you know, you know, you know what? We're te- I'm gonna get off the path here a little bit. Teenagers have a way of just exactly. And there's sometimes I want to control them by either feeding them the alligators or just grabbing them by the stuff for their neck, right? But even that, I, I have no power to control. Matter of fact, I've had to spend years just enduring the injury. And not because I had to, but because I wanted to, because I loved them so much. And your Heavenly Father endures the injury time and time again simply because to Him you're of infinite value. See, when we begin to realize that we have no control, we have to admit we have no control over another person, we probably won't be as hurt as much. And maybe we'll take all that energy of trying to take the speck out of each other's eye and deal with the telephone pole in our own eye. Just a clue. Just a clue. Human limitations, we have to admit that we are powerless to cope even with our own harmful habits. Many of us have, because of longevity, because of the payoff, the wearing the mask, because of the enemy, we have believed the lie. And we have no power to break that bondage in of ourselves. Willpower will never do it. I don't care how many self-help books you read. I don't care. We have a history, okay, of, of groups of people beating their flesh, trying to subjugate it by their own willpower. It doesn't work. I'm going to give you the clue. The reason why it never works is because the way to subjugate the flesh is that you have to transform the heart. And when you and I don't transform the heart, I don't care how much you beat it. I don't care how much you try to live in the harshest conditions. You bring your heart with you, and the minute you take your eye off it, there it comes. Willpower is not enough. We need something more. We need a power source greater than ourselves. We need a redeemer and a healer and a savior, a sanctifier and someone who has not abandoned us but promised to return back for us. And his name is Jesus. And I want us to come to a place, and this is why we come to communion. 
He's thinking about, the Bible says, do this in remembrance of me. You know what the beauty for me anyway, and not duff say it the Lord, it's just what my personal experience has been. That when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, it's not just one thing he wants us to remember. He wants us to remember him in his totality. In all that he is, in his character, in his beauty, in his glory, in his majesty, in his wonderful works, in all the things that that you and I would see in our creator God. One of the things that grabs me more than anything else, when I remember the Lord, I remember this, that I admit my need for him and so I can say, Lord, change me. But you and I need to pray and we need to look up to the God who is more than able to do the change, to transform the heart, to renew our minds, to set you and me free from a lifestyle of bondage and brokenness and failure and not part there, but realize that my Jesus already washed that clean. He has already made me whole i got to trust him for the outcome. i got to trust him because he's the miracle maker and I am not. And I realize that I'm not God. And he is. And so when I come to communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, whatever terminology you want to use, I remember that he is a God who can change me. Let's all stand. I'm going to invite everyone in the hearing of my voice in the name of the Lord because he's the one who invites you to come to his table. He's the one who comes to you and says, if you're willing, I am able in your circumstance. And I want you to be able, when you come and you take communion, you need to admit your need for Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus' transforming power. I'm not saying you have to know everything. I'm just saying that you need to know that he is God and you and I are not. And we got to confess and say, Lord, I've been trying to be the master of my own destiny. I need to confess and say, no, Jesus, your destiny for my life is my greatest joy and my greatest personal satisfaction. He invites you to come. And maybe right now you don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But he says, if you will trust me, I will take you on a journey. And on that journey, you're not going to want to turn back. We're going to play this song as the song is being played. If you can do the ABCs of following Jesus, then I invite you to come. And if right now you say, Eddie, I know I can't do that right now. That's okay. We love you. We are grateful you're here. We pray that you come back. We pray that you hear more and learn more. I would not want this to be a dead, meaningless ritual for you. So let's play this song. Feel free to come, grab the communion elements, hold on to them, and then we'll all take them together, and I'll close in prayer. I knew what I was getting into when I called you. I knew what I was getting into when I said your name, but I said it just the same. I knew what I was getting into, and I still want you. I knew what I was getting into. I knew what I was getting into, and I still chose you. Bye.
Lord, we stand before you and we know, Lord, that since the foundations of the earth, Lord, you knew our names and you called us out of darkness and into your wonderful light. And Father, that, Lord, there is no shame, no guilt, no resentment in your heart towards your beloved. And I pray, Father God, that we would be set free tonight. And Father, that your blood that was shed for us and your body that was broken for us, Lord, proves to us beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have called us by name, you have set our feet on a path, you have provided a purpose and a destiny for us. And Father, we are not under the bondage of the enemy. Thank you, Lord. Let's take his body and blood together. Father, we love you. Lord, we want you. And we ask, Lord, change us for your glory. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening.